Among them, the second seat, Kino, the sixth seat, Brandona, and the seventh seat, Miyuki, were responsible for collecting information. Naturally, the others had their own responsibilities as well. This had not been decided after discussion, and neither had they been forced into their role. Rather, they had ended up that way before they knew it. Also, the three of them further divided the work among themselves. Incidentally, the first seat, Suzuki Satoru, was responsible for coordinating them and for combat. They ignored the steadily increasing number of flying stones and their growing force, instead advancing without hesitation. Just a little more. Got it. Shun. Oh okay. yeah. And at last. You are. Their vision cleared up. Kino cried out in joy. The wind suddenly vanished. When they looked behind them, what looked like black walls extended forever up and down, left and right. Looking around, it seemed as though they had entered a gigantic tube. What they saw after that was a vast, yet silent expanse of pure white sand. While it was marred by the occasional ripple, it did not grow overly large, and all they could see everywhere was white. Hey. Look. The sky. As though drawn by Kino's voice, Suzuki Satoru, Crystal who had poked his head out of Suzuki Satoru's robe and probably Nurinura as well, all looked up to the heavens. The night sky came into view, but this was not like an ordinary night sky. The stars seemed very close to them. It was just like in children's fairy tales the big, bright shining stars looked as if they could just reach out and touch them. It made him think of the past when they had stood on the summit of the highest mountain on the continent No, the distance to the sky made him feel like the peak he had ascended had been even higher. But why? Why do the stars look like they're so close to us? Perhaps it's due to atmospheric diffraction. Nurinura's voice strands vibrated as he explained. Suzuki Satoru simply nodded. Huh. My guess is that the atmosphere has been warped, forming what seems to be a gigantic lens. Perhaps it was caused by the tornado. That might be the case. Nu, what was all that just now? In other words, there's something like a telescope above our heads. A telescope. Is it one of those things invented by that weird technology called science? Science is dumb, the stuff it makes can't compare to magic items. Crystal was not the least bit shy about saying that. In truth, the fact that magic could create something out of nothing, meant that there was nothing wrong with saying it was better than science. This was just a hypothesis, but Suzuki Satoru felt that all the technology that he understood could be reproduced through magic. However, learning magic required talent, and everyone's aptitude was different. Some people could learn magic and others could not. Crystal's words indicated that he belonged to the former group. Suzuki Satoru clapped his hands. Now then, let's go investigate the source of this phenomenon before the tornado vanishes. Alright, but it doesn't look like there's anything. The cause of this phenomenon is still a mystery. Hmm, I can't sense any turbulence in the elements around here either. Leader, what about the magical end of things? Suzuki Satoru cast a spell and looked out into the distance. Nothing there either. It wasn't caused by a spell, I think. Kino flew to a certain height, and then descended to the ground. I don't see anything that looks like a building around here, what on earth is this? A natural phenomenon. That's the only way we can explain it, right? After hearing Suzuki Satoru say that, the others responded in agreement. Much like how reverse waterfalls that float up existed, there were many bizarre sights in this world that were natural occurrences. In any case, let's go to the center of the tornado and take a look. After that, we'll explore a little and if we don't find anything, we'll go stargazing. Nobody objected to this, and the group flew towards the center of the tornado with Crystal leading the way. And then, there's nothing here. Nothing, huh? There shouldn't be anything, right? What a shame. That was the result of a rough search. What should we do now, leader? Keep looking. Suzuki Satoru shrugged at Nurinura's question. There's no need, I guess. If we can't find it, then we can't find it. It doesn't matter. Besides, our aim was to go where nobody else had set foot before, and since we've done that, everyone's free to do whatever they want until the tornado vanishes. Then I'll go take a walk around the area with Nu. Ah. Well, that's fine too. I understand. Let's go, then. You're really going? Then take care not to stray too far. The two of them voiced their acknowledgement as they left together. Despite what Suzuki Satoru had said, he was not worried about their safety. In Yggdrasil terms, they were easily above level 40. They were among the most powerful beings in the world, and the two of them had excellent sensory abilities. Even if ambushed, they were skilled enough to return alive. Satoru, then what should we do? Want to go take a walk around here too? Yup. Kino began to run. Her footprints marked the pure white sand. Suzuki Satoru followed her footprints, his strides slightly larger than when he usually went walking with Kino. Still, this was just fine for Suzuki Satoru. In the end, Kino sat on the sand and slowly lay down. Suzuki Satoru sat down beside her, and then lay down beside her. The stars are so big. Yeah, they're really big. 
If only his companions, his friends from Ain Zulgaon could see this marvelous sight. Those were memories from roughly 200 years ago, and after each adventure with Kino and the others, they had gradually faded away. But as he remembered the faces of the only friends he ever had, Suzuki Satoru looked on the mysterious vistas with nostalgia in his heart. Still, this really is amazing. Yeah, seeing this means our trip wasn't in vain. Yeah. The two of them lay on the sand in silence, watching this wonder of the world, a marvel whose veil of mystery nobody else had managed to pull back until now. And then the stars gradually shrank, or perhaps they were slowly returning to normal. Suzuki Satoru propped himself up, and saw that the walls of the tornado surrounding them were slowly receding. It's over, huh? Yeah, it's going to end. It'll be another 30 years before we can see something like this. Now then, want to tell the others about what we saw here? Suzuki Satoru asked Kino, who stood up and shook her head. How can you see the rainbow if you don't go through the storm? That makes sense, you got that right. See, I managed to get the better of you just now. Suzuki Satoru smiled. Oh my, the two of you seem pretty happy. Did anything special happen? Nothing special, no. The other two had probably seen the tornado start to fade, and so they had returned. They did not seem to be holding any fines. Perhaps they really had been strolling around for a while. Let's head back to the inn, then. Yo. Do the honors, Satoru. But before that, let's shake off the sand on ourselves. It's only a little, but I don't want to bring it back to our room. Everyone patted down their clothes and shook off the sand. Nurunuru was wearing an item that Suzuki Satoru had lent him, and he helped the others pat their clothes clean. After that, Suzuki Satoru cast gate, and the group returned to their room in the inn. We'll be off, then. Thanks, everyone. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for your hard work, everyone. Hope you all have a good night. Nurunuru and Crystal who was sitting on his head left the room. I'm so tired Kino said. That made no sense, however. Both of them were undead, and they would not accumulate exhaustion. However, Suzuki Satoru understood her meaning. Her fatigue was not of the body, but of the mind. You're tired too, ha, huh, Kino. Suzuki Satoru shed the robe on his body and changed into something else in an instant. That was because the robe he had been wearing earlier had a quick change effect on it. Kino changed in a similar manner. Suzuki Satoru flopped down on the sofa in the room and took pen and paper out of his inventory. This was his diary. He did not write in it every day, but only when something special happened. Thus, he was only on his fourth volume after 200 years. He opened a new page, planning to write down what he had seen today, but then he felt a familiar weight pressing down on him. Kino, why don't you go take a bath? I was planning to make an entry in my diary. Yeah, go ahead and write. That's not what I mean. How am I supposed to write my diary with you clinging to my back? Hmm, then you can write it on the way back. In his heart, Suzuki Satoru shook his head and sighed. Fine fine fine, as my princess commands. Hmm, well done, my knight. I was a court wizard last time, Suzuki Satoru thought as he closed his diary. Well he could have just ignored her and continued writing in his diary, it would cause problems in the future. Well the intense emotions of the undead would be quickly suppressed, letting subtle grudges build only made them stronger. What do you plan to do next? Where shall we go? I was thinking, in the past, the big nations in the center were just places we passed through. Perhaps we ought to establish a base for ourselves so we can tour the surroundings. Maybe we could look into an abandoned city. There were many nations in the center of the continent where the humanoid species were on the bottom of the totem pole. They were all troublesome countries for people like Kino with humanoid appearances. While they allowed travelers certain rights, they were by no means safe places. For instance, she had once been treated as an escape meal in the market of an orc nation. And in the land of the Minotaurs, someone had said, let's see who treats their slaves better, and she had experienced the so-called slave life too. Troublesome things like that had happened to her too. In the case of the former, she had covered it up by breaking a pair of arms and part of their ribs. As for the latter, she had let them experience the slave life themselves, and then asked them how it felt. An abandoned city, so you mean the one where they say a lot of people died because soul leaders showed up. It seems the entire city was preserved intact. Exactly. Entry is forbidden, but we can go if we want, right? Yes, going there sounds pretty good. Suzuki Satoru laughed. For many years, they had been to places where normal people could not set foot. Or rather, if they heard of some sanctuary or divine place, they would take it upon themselves to go there. As for why, well, it was because they had once found a world-class item there once. That was how Kino had obtained her item the Two Worlds Mandala. They had seen other world-class items during their journey. However, they had owners, so they did not seize them. Suzuki Satoru originally wanted to take them, but he did not, because he had Kino by his side. After all, he did not want to do anything awkward like mugging people in front of Kino. The Two Worlds Mandala had once been a national treasure, but the country that had served as his sanctuary had been destroyed, and then a new country had sprung up in its place. 
Thus, they pretended that it was onerous. In compensation, they left behind many items and huge gems and such, and so the two of them managed to get around that particular pitfall. But I want to head west. The west. What's over there? He looked through his memories, but he could not recall anything worth noting on the west. Well, it's information from Yu Chan. He said the three countries had fallen in the north of the continent. Therefore, I wanted to head west and see what's going on. Since it was information from the seventh seat, it ought to be true. He looked completely unlike what the cute nickname of Mu Chan would suggest, but perhaps it was different in the eyes of his mother or perhaps his sister. Suzuki Satori discarded the question of his appearance for a moment and began recalling the world map. The Northwest Borders. He recalled that 200 years ago, there had been a few human nations up there, but since it was in the hinterlands, he had not thought much about it. Well, it's true that nations being destroyed isn't exactly uncommon, but for three to go down at once. There were incredibly powerful monsters in the world, and sometimes they would show up, annihilate a nation or two, and then new countries would take their place. Granted, some large nations might not be destroyed so easily, but it was not rare for such things to serve as the spark for internal unrest or invasion, eventually leading to the nation's destruction. But to his recollection, he had never heard of several countries being destroyed at the same time. What on earth happened? Just as Suzuki Satori was about to turn around and look at Kino who was lying on his back, he heard her exclaim Mac. In a cute way before she fell off. Mimi. Don't move around. After you, after you. Suzuki flopped down on the table again, and Kino mounted him once more. Well, I think he said something about a nest of really powerful demons showing up. A nest. Of powerful demons. Hmm. What was it called? The Great Underground Tomb of Nazarek. Eh? It was a name that sounded somewhat familiar.